Uh, thank you, Jane. That was a wonderful way to start the morning. Our next keynote uh, speaker actually probably uh, actually doesn't need introduction, but I'll introduce him anyway. Um, Professor, uh, Professor Shailendra Raj Mehta is currently the president and director of uh, MECA, and he had uh, been president of Aro University in Ahmedabad University earlier. But he came, to, came back to India uh, in 2006 with, as a, as a, joint, at a collaboration between Duke and IIM, uh, Ahmedabad. And before that, he taught at Purdue for about 16 years. Um, he has a PhD from Harvard and uh, MPhil from Oxford, but his uh, basic degrees are from St. Stephen's and Delhi School of Economics, so he's truly an international expert. And uh, what I find fascinating that uh, he's, he's an he's a economics and strategic management uh, professor, but he has founded high-tech companies in Purdue, uh, fintech companies, and uh, so he uh, is consulted widely as well. So he kind of uh, um, transitions between the uh, business world, tech world, and uh, today he's uh, going to talk about strengthening governance and culture as keys to building world-class universities. Shailendra. So Dr. Nath Dr. Nathan has uh, spoken about two aspects of my life, but I'm going to talk about my third secret aspect, uh, which is a quest, an intellectual quest that I've been on for the last 10 years. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how that happened towards the end, but for now, uh, let me just start with what makes universities distinctive. So I'm going to share with you some new perspectives and some new data that I hope will help you think through the absolutely wonderful institution that we call the modern university. I mean, this is one of the most interesting organizations ever invented by humans, and I want to convey some of that excitement to you. So first of all, why are universities so distinctive? So the, the reason why these are so distinctive is because the... Uh, the universities are examples of what are called market failure. They have three major failures all at the same time. What economists call externalities, asymmetric information, and public goods. So the point was first made by Socrates in the West. In India, of course, that point is made earlier. Socrates says, and this is from uh, the dialogues uh, uh, of Plato. He says, if you want to buy food, you can very quickly find out whether the food is good or not. But if you want to buy education, you cannot find out whether it is good or bad until it is too late. And if we look at the Indian ecosystem in the last uh, couple of decades, we know that there were several fly-by-night operators, mercifully they have now been shut down, but who for several years essentially took the students and the parents for a huge ride. Now, so how is, so uh, think about, so I've, uh, so think about, so I've shared with you the asymmetric information part. Now the public goods part. I've put up a one page paper that was published in Nature on the 25th of April, 1953. All of you know, this is the famous paper about the double helix. Just a one page paper, you have to understand. This is one of the monuments in world history. It underpins the trillion dollar uh, biotechnology industry today. It's just a one-page paper. Just a one-page paper. This is a classic example of a public good created by public funds at Cambridge University. Right? There is no way in which any institution other than a university would have been able to create something like this. And furthermore, this is why the university is so special and why it is so different. So, uh, uh, so and then Thirdly, there are production externalities. And this is one of the major reasons why the market forces cannot operate in universities, which is, think of it as follows. If you went to Nalanda 
the ancient University of India, which I'll talk about a little later, or Vikramshil, which was the most evolved ancient university. Before you were admitted, you would have to come in through one of the six major gates. And at every gate, there was what was called a university professor, a Dwara Pandit. The six most famous scholars each had a gate assigned to them. And if a student came in, the student at the gate had to impromptu engage in a viva, and only then, if you satisfied the most demanding academic at the age of 16 years, you know, you were a young boy, in Nalanda, these were men's universities, there was a women's university also, we'll talk about that later if there is time, but, um, so, and then you got in, why? Because they wanted only the brightest students to get in there, and the brightest faculty to get in there, why? Because we all know this, the reason why, uh, for example, Rochester is such a wonderful school is because they try and get the best and the brightest. And you learn, so if you have the best professors, you learn more. If you have the best fellow students, you learn more. In economic terms, these are externalities. So why does the market mechanism fail? I'm sure, and we have known this from the scandal, the recent scandal uh, that happened in the United States, that people are pay, willing to pay millions of dollars for a position in one of these prestigious universities, yet these universities turn them away. So it's a complete failure. So you don't clear the market, you don't clear the admissions list by following the ability to pay, which is what you would do in the marketplace. If somebody is willing to pay a million dollars for your product, you'll bend over backwards to satisfy that demand, but not in a university environment. So there's a triple failure. So there's a triple failure, so to repeat, you have externalities, public goods, and asymmetric information. So the whole university structure, and this is what I want to convey to you, has been designed not once, but this has been, this has independently occurred twice in human history. Once in India, over 1800 years, from Takshila in the sixth century BC to, uh, uh, to Nalanda and all the others, right up until the, third, uh, the 12th century. For 1800 years, that evolution happened, and I'll share with you some key aspects later. But for now, understand that the same thing then was recreated in Europe from starting in Bologna in 1088 and then coming up to the great American universities, right? So the same problems were solved in almost the same way. So how do you solve it? First of all, uh, you need, so if you're going to have the best and the brightest students come in regardless of need, and this was recognized early on in India, you have to have huge, huge support for higher education. Private provision of public goods just does not work. So right from the earlier day, earliest days, some of the most fascinating mechanisms have been found to fund this. I won't go into what happened in India, but we know what happened in Europe and the United States, how these were funded. Endowments were created, and furthermore, pri uh, 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 people gave benefactions, uh, uh, etc., to fund this. Now, Basically, five models of governance, and by the way, some of this material I'm showing for the first time, even though I've been working on this for 10 years. This in particular, I have not shared earlier. It's in one of my papers, but um, not quite in this fashion. There are five models of governance. One doesn't work at all. It's there, it always leads to scandals, um, and all the universities that follow a pure profit model have led to scandals worldwide. In the United States, Every year, there is a scandal with for-profit institutions somewhere uh, or the other. And in the Philippines, which is the other country which allows for-profit uh, education, there have always been, you know, there are always scandals and quality issues. So there are four other governance mechanisms. I've shared with you why private uh, for-profit education, higher education doesn't work, for all the reasons that I've mentioned. So there are four other models. They also, three of them have major problems. Uh, the first is trusts, right? So you create a trust, a self-perpetuating trust, but then there is the problem of uh, essentially uh, information and also an alignment of incentives because of the trust is captured by people who have private interests at heart, then that can create a problem. This, uh, the third mechanism that was used was the state, but that can also create a problem because the state it's not easy for the state to get access to real-time, accurate information. So all universities that are run by the state, to some extent, have this governance issue of getting proper information. Then the 
Fourth mechanism is absolutely the worst. It's not even worse than the private provision of public goods, which is governance by faculty, which means if you put faculty on the governing boards of universities, it is like insider trading. And in my paper, I mention that uh, the university that followed this model was until the 1900s, the richest university in the United States. Today it is Harvard, but in those days it was Columbia. Columbia was earlier called King's College and it had the richest lands in New York, so therefore it had the biggest income. So I show in my paper that in 1880, a typical Harvard professor was paid $2,500, which in today's money is about $100,000. But the typical Columbia professor, because they were all on the board and they controlled the endowment, paid themselves three times as much, $7,500 in 1880, which is $300,000 in today's money. They ate up the endowment. And ultimately, uh, it was a huge outcry, and ultimately they went on to follow the fifth model which I've put up here, which is the alumni governance model. So let me share a, a fascinating uh, table, which is the composition. So this is what I did when I returned back to India, is I called up the top 100 universities in the US. Some of this information was online, but a lot of it was not. So I called them up, and I said, give me your board composition. What you, what you find here is absolutely striking. Uh, that uh, almost all of them have majority alumni governance. In fact, only one doesn't in this list, this uh, top 10 list, as it were. And by the way, this is equally true for the public institutions. Now,